you cannot have uh, successful physical reconstruction in any sustainable, durable way without um, having well-functioning pluralistic uh, institutions. Dear friends, welcome to another edition of Forum 2000 Online Chats. My name is Martin L. I'm from Czech Economy Daily, Hospodářské noviny. Today we have with us Richard Youngs. Richard is Senior Fellow at the, in the Democracy, Conflict and Governance Program based in Carnegie, Europe. He is also a member of Forum 2000 Conference Program Council and of the International Coalition of, for Democracy, Re, Democratic Renewal. He works on EU foreign policy and on issues of international democracy. Richard is also a Professor of International Relations at the University of Warwick. Richard, welcome to the Forum 2000 Chats. Hello. Richard is author of short study on democratic roadmap for Ukraine, which naturally looks beyond the horizon of recent events. This paper is a result of cooperation between Forum 2000 and European Democracy Hub. Richard, let's start with your assessment of current situation in Ukraine in connection with your topic. Is war, as we see it now, strengthening Ukrainian paths towards democracy? I think it's too early to say that yet. And obviously, at the moment, the focus is justifiably on uh, fighting the war and the help that Ukraine needs to successfully execute the, the war. So it's it's understandable that there are so, so many different elements of the conflict and international responses to the conflict that speak to agendas other than the democracy agenda. But what the um, the focus of Forum 2000 and what we've been doing in the European Democracy Hub tries to do is to um, put the issue of democracy at least on the agenda, not least because some consideration is uh, just beginning to be given to the longer term plans for reconstruction. Um, and it will be important to ensure that issues of democratic reform are given adequate voice in that agenda. It's very, very complicated to do that at the moment, as I say, because there are many more pressing, urgent, short-term imperatives that have to do with the war, uh, to be speaking about the need to consider the complex issues of longer term political reform, political openness in Ukraine is not meant in any way to take the focus and the priority away from these more immediate uh, imperatives. It's more simply to put the issue on the agenda and to uh, recall that all these um, very concerted international efforts that are just gathering pace should not forget the fact that this is a war um, that is being carried out in the name of democratic values, as President Zelensky, President Biden, Macron and others constantly remind us. Um, and it will eventually be important, necessary to uh, implement policies that have more of a kind of tangible relevance to democracy building than is the case at, at the moment. When we uh, speak about reconstruction in Ukraine, usually it, it's meant uh, that it's physical on the, the infrastructure. But what about institutions? Do you think... Uh... Uh, or which institutions do you think Ukraine would need to reconstruct most? So what our analysis, our analysis uh, argues is that it's perfectly understandable that the priority will be on f physical reconstruction. The country will need this in almost limitless qu qu quantities of uh, money. But there is an institutional dimension to that. The lesson from other conflict and post-conflict um, uh, experiences is that you cannot have uh, successful physical reconstruction in any sustainable, durable way without um, having well-functioning pluralistic uh, institutions. Um, we all know as well that one of the really, really impressive features of Ukraine's resistance over the last uh, months has come at the civil society level. Um, we're all in absolute admiration of the government, of the president for their resilience, but this is a whole of society approach that Ukraine seems to have developed um, and uh, perfected in very, very impressive ways. And, and so the uh, international help for the longer term also needs to focus on, on uh, building this civic capacity that will be so important to taking Ukraine uh, into the future. Uh, we all know that before the war started, uh, Ukrainian democracy was in a kind of fragile balance. There were some elements of reform, democratic reform being implemented. Other areas where international institutions were actually expressing concern with the failure of the government to actually implement, to take forward democratic reforms. So what we um, argue in the paper is that there will be quite a difficult balance to strike between um, offering help as quickly as possible, as smoothly, as flexibly as possible to Ukraine on the one hand, and um, making sure that these uh, longer-term reform issues don't get pushed off the agenda 
um, in 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 the midst of the, the the emergency associated with the war. Again, I reiterate, we're not saying here that these are issues that should displace uh, the, the the focus on the war and the, the very necessary help that is needed uh, to help the war effort at the moment, but simply that as uh, these huge amounts of money will become available over the longer term, that we look for ways to build in this political focus and not just a focus on physical reconstruction that you mentioned. Uh, speaking about money, you know, Ukraine was... Uh famous in quotation mark before the war for a huge corruption. Uh, do you think that, uh, what's your assessment on, on terms of anti-corruption measures being taken or being possible to be taken during the war when usually war is creating more space for this informal dealings in for the sake of the victory? So uh, do you think that uh, this, this topic of corruption could be used or misused by the, uh, let's say, uh, uh russians as a kind of a propaganda tool or is it could could be used also in positive sense uh for building or strengthening new institutions so i'd say two things there i mean it, it's true you, ukraine got a lot of crit criticism for the corruption issue uh, and rightly so um and in, in fact had a lot of international money held back at least temporarily uh, over 2019 2020 2021 Uh, because of corruption, amongst other concerns to do with, with democratic quality. I say two things now. I think the situation, the political panorama has fundamentally changed on the ground, as far as I understand it, because of the uh, crisis, because this is a war being um, uh, taken forward in the name of uh, political values. It's almost awoken a new um, focus and commitment to democratic values amongst Ukrainians. And what one is struck from the outside that um, uh, civil society in Ukraine has almost reinforced its focus on the need for good quality of dem democracy during the war, N not thought that that is somehow expendable because of the imperatives related to the war. So I think in that sense, the I'm not sure a future government in Ukraine would get away with any um, kind of sanguine or relaxed attitude towards corruption has perhaps may have been the case in the past. I think if anything, they will be under greater pressure uh, to implement good quality, open political governance in, in the future. And the second thing I would say is that uh, despite the war, it seems quite remarkable that um, the Ukrainian state is still moving forward with many reform issues, in particular, in particular, and this is something we bring out in the analysis, those reforms associated with the um, now just starting accession process to prepare Ukraine for getting into the EU. This is a really important area of debate that somehow needs to be linked in with the, the conflict itself. Ukraine now does have the potential prize of getting into the EU. That it's a really onerous task to implement thousands and thousands of reforms. We argue that the EU needs to be a little bit flexible on this and helping Ukraine move along that path in a steady uh, fashion, not simply leaving the prize of coming into the EU and kind of hanging passively in the air for 10 or 20 uh, years. But it is, does seem remarkable to me that even at this technical level of certain governance reforms, Ukraine is moving forward on corruption and other issues as well, uh, despite trying to, despite fighting a war at the moment. Um, these reforms need a lot of state capacity. I think that's where international help will be extremely important. Um, and where we believe that the focus needs to needs to be paid in in the in the, over the sh in the short term, but also especially in in the medium term. Uh, you mentioned already that the, the activities of the so civil society uh, in 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 the war effort. So is is this decentralized form of Ukrainian resistance, which we see also in the civil so society part, uh, something which can uh, in the future empower Ukrainian democracy in the long term? Absolutely, definitely. I mean, actually, even before the war, Ukraine had a, a, a fairly powerful and dynamic civil society, a, a, as as was the case with many um, uh, other countries in the region as well. Um, o obviously, uh, civil society organizations have taken a knock back because of the war. Uh, many have had to leave the country. The context is extremely uh, challenging. Uh, but at least for someone following this from outside, one cannot fail to be extremely impressed with their Uh, resilience and perseverance, and also their kind of organizational skills in um, uh, keeping some kind of civic, civic organization and dynamism going around issues that are um, re related to Ukraine's general political situation, but also the, the short-term exigencies of, of the war as well. Um, and I think that stands Ukraine in uh, 
good stead for the longer term. And I think the role will be to make sure that that uh, resilience and organization at the civil level is actually fully connected in with what's going on at the at the political level as all the money flows into the government for reconstruction and, and also the process of preparing U- Ukraine for coming into the EU moves forward as well. But analysts often criticise the process of EU enlargement in the past for having been overly technical, overly focused just on government institutions and on state ministries. I think it's clear because of the nature of the way in which the war has been fought in Ukraine that the preparation for Ukraine's accession looks qualitatively different in the future and it includes civil society actors and other pro-democratic voices as well in a much more systemic way. Um, Would you say or bet uh, when Ukraine could become a EU member? Uh, Don't forget Ukraine and other so-called Eastern Partnership countries have actually been um, aligning themselves in a technical sense with EU laws for quite some number of years, really since 2014, 2015. There are some institutes that calculate that uh, Ukraine, other countries as well, have already adopted 60-70% of EU um, acquis. So they're perhaps starting with a slight advantage compared to the state, the starting line that other pre-accession countries uh, started from. Uh, Still, the challenge will be uh, very severe. I think um, existing EU member states still need to make this crucial decision. They've already made a crucial geopolitical decision in opening the doors to Ukraine membership, but they still need to make this, I, I would say, defining decision as of whether um, accession is a kind of low-key technical process that can go on for many, many decades, or whether this really is now the EU's political priority, um, in which case the EU can certainly show the commitment to making sure the process is a bit more flexible and, and it moves forward perhaps in stages, uh, more concrete steps, so that Ukraine is helped in a more concrete um, and proactive way than some of then perhaps some of the other candidate states have been helped in previous enlargements. And I think if that more active help is brought to bear, then uh, Ukraine could come in sooner rather than later. It will still be a reasonably long process, but crucially, some of the concrete benefits of enlargement uh, can be offered to Ukraine in a shorter time frame rather than simply left hanging as a kind of general motivating factor over um, quite a long period of time. Uh, can we uh, step back and, and look at the, at the situation now from the wider perspective? Uh, could international effort to help Ukraine uh, strengthen also traditional Western democracies, which are struggling last years uh, when uh, facing growing populism at home and authoritarianism abroad? Certainly, I think that's the common line that's now argued, and m- many uh, analysts have argued very powerfully that uh, democracy's future Uh, now hinges on what happens in Ukraine. Democracy's future, not just in Ukraine, but uh, more widely as well. Our analysis, in this sense, comes down on a a slightly more nuanced argument. Yes, a successful uh, pursuit of the war in Ukraine will certainly have a give a broader impulse and prompt to democratic reforms elsewhere in the world. It can revitalize the whole democratic project on a global basis, Uh, but we shouldn't overstate that case. I don't think democracy's future will hinge solely or primarily on what happens in Ukraine. Don't forget, in many countries um, around the world, democracy's fate still depends on quite locally specific factors. It's not really directly related to what's going on in Ukraine. And despite, despite the undoubted um systemat- systemic level importance of what's going on in Ukraine. One should not lose sight of the fact that not everything is about the Ukraine war in other parts of the world and that those interested in democratic reforms need to keep working on a very complex array of challenges in other parts of the world as well and not reduce this, not reduce this simply to one kind of binary battle between democracy and autocracy that revolves around um, the situation in, in, in Ukraine itself. That was another edition of Forum 2000 on Lighthouse. I thank uh, Richard Youngs, Senior Fellow from Carnegie Europe and Professor of International Relations at the University of Warwick. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much.